Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, City Light. Yes, it is a good morning because I get to do one of my all-time favorite things, uh, get into God's Word with all of you. We are going to be in Luke chapter 5 today. So if you got your Bible or your app with you, you can go ahead and open to Luke 5, um, verse 27. While you're doing that, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my experience as a car detailer. When I was in high school, I worked at Red Oak, Chrysler, Plymouth, Dodge, Jeep, and Eagle. A few of those makes are now defunct, but not while I was there, all right? The Eagle Talon was a hot car back when I was in school. Um, I worked there as a detailer, and I worked with a guy named Harlan. Harlan was a lifelong bachelor who was rough around more than just the edges, all right? He uh, used a lot of four-letter words. He told a lot of colorful stories about getting drafted and serving in Vietnam. And maybe one of the things he was most proud of was sharing a birthday with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, <laughs> That's about the only thing those two had in common, but he was excited about it. That also meant Harlan was 37 years older than me, okay? Uh, he had been detailing cars for a long, long time. Uh, and so when I got there, I was supposed to learn the ropes from Harlan. And so I was there for a few weeks. He taught me a few things. But after, after a few weeks of detailing cars with Harlan... I started getting this idea that Harlan was pretty lucky that the boss had hired me because I noticed some things that might make his work a little more efficient. You know, after I could teach him a thing or two about how to do his job. Uh, one of the things I noticed was when Harlan detailed a car, he would always start by washing the inside of the windshield. And then after he cleaned the inside of the windshield, he would wipe down the vinyl on the dash and the radio and the steering wheel, do the other glass, the, the chairs and the carpet and all that stuff. And inevitably, while he was doing all the rest of the stuff, he would touch the windshield and there would be smudges. And then he would have to go back and like spot clean the smudges on the windshield. And so one day I thought, you know what? I've had enough. This is hard to watch. I'm going to let Harlan know how to do this job. And so uh, my scrawny, teenage, new guy self steps up to Harlan, the Vietnam vet <laughs> who's done this for decades. And I said, you know, Harlan, there's a better way. And I explained to him the error of his ways. He was not excited to hear from me. And after I got done explaining, he just looked at me and said, all right, try it your way. So I pulled the next car in. And uh, I cleaned everything before the inside of the windshield, the dash, the seats, the steering wheel, the radio. I got it all done. And then I shake that glass cleaner, and I spray it on the windshield, and guess what happened? Suds fell everywhere. Not just the dash. It was the steering wheel, the radio, the seats. The, I mean, that stuff sprays everywhere. And so after I cleaned the windshield, I had to wipe down pretty much everything all the vinyl in the front half of the car, again, to make sure that there were no spots. And Harlan, with a smug look on his face, says, if you want to wipe all the vinyl twice, that's fine, but I'll stick to just spot cleaning a couple smudges. <laughs> all right, Harlan, I get it. Look, we both wanted to do a good job detailing cars. We both wanted to keep the boss happy with our work. We both wanted to work efficiently to hit the daily quota of cars that we were supposed to clean. But there was a difference between Harlan and I. One of us had something to teach and the other had something to learn. And I got that mixed up. Have you ever been there? Friends, I think in Luke chapter 5, we're going to see a similar dynamic going on between Jesus and the people of Israel. One has something to teach, the other has something to learn, and they get mixed up. Look, I thought my method was right and Harlan's was wrong, but I was just filled with youthful pride. Harlan was the teacher, I was the student, I was there to learn from him. Things went best when we both were in our right lane. And so, uh, in Luke chapters 4 and 5, 
we see Jesus begin teaching from town to town across the region of Galilee and northern Israel. Crowds are gathering, uh, recognizing that they've got a lot to learn from this Jesus. And then after teaching by a lake, Jesus told a fisherman named Simon Peter to go back out into the water and put out his nets again. Jesus, this new teacher, tells this lifelong fisherman to go back to work after closing time. To go back to work after everybody else had gone home. To go back to work and keep at it even when it seemed like none of the fish were biting. And Peter looks at Jesus and says, man, we were just out all night. We caught nothing. Feels like me talking to Harlan. Are you sure you know what you're talking about? But Peter, unlike me, after pleading his case, did not insist on his own way. Instead, he said to Jesus, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when he did that, he brought in a haul of fish so massive that it nearly sunk his boat. He had to call his buddies, James and John, over to help him out and rescue him. It was such a miracle that Peter immediately recognized this Jesus is the Christ, the Lord, the Son of God. And Jesus looked at him and said, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And somebody's thinking, Eric, you got the wrong passage, man. That one was from a couple weeks ago. Why all the review? That's a good question. Listen, I want you to hear the message today in light of this miracle because I think this miracle sets the stage for us to be looking for the ways that Jesus' methods are not like ours. Jesus is doing something new. He's got something to teach his people. And if we don't sit in the seat of the student, we're going to miss out. And there were people in Jesus' days that missed it, all right? So Jesus is a teacher. He's ready to teach his people, and I want us to see what he's about to teach. After Peter caught that haul of fish, and Jesus said, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to be catching men. Peter accepted that invitation, left his boat behind, followed Jesus, and got a front row seat to watch how Jesus was going to start catching men. To sit in the seat of a student and watch the teacher do what he promised to do. And from the front row seat, Peter got to see Jesus touch a leper. Nobody else would go there. Nobody else would get close to a leper's colony. Nobody else would touch a guy like that. That guy had a contagious disease that struck fear into everyone else on earth. Nobody else is going fishing for that guy. But Jesus was teaching something new. He went and touched the leper. And you know what? The leprosy didn't spread to Jesus. Jesus made the leper clean. Jesus went to places nobody else would go to catch fish that nobody else was catching. He's teaching a new method for catching men. And after that, Peter in the front row seat got to watch Jesus heal a paralyzed man. In those days, there are no ADA laws, there's no wheelchair accessibility, there's no modern assistive devices. Paralyzation was devastating. This guy would have been a heavy burden on his family, friends, and society. He had all sorts of needs that needed met and literally nothing to give back in return. He's a beggar and a burden. And when nobody else would make room to let him in a house. Jesus saw him, forgave his sin, healed him, and he stood up and walked home. He is uh, going places nobody else would go to catch men nobody else is catching. He's got a new way of fishing for men. And that brings us to our passage today where Jesus is gonna keep right on that same track. Our passage begins... After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, Levi rose and followed Jesus. So what do we learn about Levi right away? He is a tax collector. 
Nobody likes guys like Levi, all right? Uh, we know this. You don't have to raise your hand, but yet, have you ever had a bill sent to collections? Have you ever had to deal with a collector, all right? I have uh, one time when my uh, son was little, he had a problem with his eye, had to have surgery to clear a tear duct. Um, the hospital marked us as self-pay by mistake. We had insurance, but got marked as self-pay. And so we had this huge bill to pay. And the hospital told me that they would not send us to collections while they worked things out with the insurance company. But uh, despite their best efforts, it did get sent to collections still. And this collector called me multiple times a week for weeks hounding me to pay and telling me horror stories of what would happen if I didn't. I asked, answered about a quarter of his calls and explained the situation over and over and over and over again to the exact same guy who then would make all kinds of threats about what was going to happen if I didn't pay. He was threatening to call my employer and garnish my wages and all this stuff, even though he knew that the hospital was working on it with my insurance company. Eventually, the insurance company paid and it all worked out. But dealing with a collector was awful. And if you think dealing with a collector today is awful, Levi and his tax collector buddies were exponentially worse. See, Rome did what was called tax farming. They would set the tax rate for a certain area and then um, put tax collection up for bid, give it to the highest bidder. So if they set the tax rate here and the highest bidder said, I think I can collect double that, Rome says go. And then that tax collector has to collect all that money and give it to Rome. And then they made their money by adding more and collecting on top of that. So tax farming is a system that is just ripe and ready for corruption. And in an already corrupt system, Levi adds insult to injury. Because Levi is a Jewish man working for Rome. He's literally bought into the occupier's system of rule and is personally profiting from the oppression of his own people. Tax collectors, scumbags, all right? They're just the lowest of low lives you could meet. They were known to be so untrustworthy, they could not act as a witness in court. They were known to be so vile and wicked, they were not allowed in the synagogue. Later in Luke's gospel, there's a religious leader who prays, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. They're grouped in with extortioners, rejectors of justice, and cheaters, and they're listed last as the worst. These guys are lowlifes. The lowest of the low you could ever meet. With that in mind, imagine walking down the road and seeing Levi sitting at his tax booth. What do you do? You do whatever it takes to not pass that booth. You do whatever you can to not get noticed by that guy. I don't want to make eye contact with him. I don't want him to make eye contact with me. I'll take the long way around if I can to avoid any interaction with that wicked dude. Nobody wants to talk to him except Jesus. What does the Bible say? After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting in his tax booth. That word for saw isn't like talking about peripheral vision. It's talking about he looked at him. Jesus looked right at the guy nobody else wanted to see. He literally saw Levi sitting in his sin and did not look away he locks eyes. Pause for a moment. Who is the tax collector in your world? 
Who are the people that you avoid? Who do you consider the lowest of low lives? Grouped in with extortioners, rejecters of justice, and cheaters. Maybe it's a family member who is supposed to care about you but hurt you instead. Maybe it's the rich people, the one percenters. Maybe it's the poor people who are always begging. Maybe it's people who go to a rival school or work for a rival company, cheer for a rival team, support a rival candidate. I don't know who it is for you, but if we're honest, we all put somebody in the category we don't want to see. We want to avoid. I don't know who it is for you. It's, it's the people that you might look at and think, I would never fish where, where that person is swimming. They don't deserve God's grace, and if he wants to give it to them, he's going to have to do it through somebody other than me. It's pretty likely that Peter the fisherman would have had thoughts like that about Levi. There's a good chance that Levi or one of his tax collector buddies had cheated Peter and James and John. So the same guys who questioned Jesus at the lake saying, Jesus, we worked all night in that lake and caught nothing. Nothing good came of our labor out there. You want us to go back? Now they look at Levi, the tax collector, and say, Jesus, we have walked past that guy our whole lives. Nothing good has ever come of it. And you want us to go back? You see what Jesus is doing? He's teaching them a new way of fishing, not just on the lake, but in the world. Fishing for men. Look at what happens next. After this, Jesus went out, saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, Levi rose and followed Jesus. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at Jesus' disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus went to places nobody else was going. To catch men nobody else was catching. He called the failed fishermen, he touched the outcast leper, he healed the helpless paralytic, and he invited Levi, the wicked cheat, to follow him. And what did Levi do? He accepted Jesus' invitation with an invitation of his own. You bet I'll follow you, and I'll do you one better. I'm going to invite you, Jesus, to a dinner party tonight, thrown in your honor, and I'm going to invite all my rowdy friends to come over tonight and celebrate you too. I want them all to meet you. And in verse 30, notice who is at the party. Did you catch it? The Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at Jesus' disciples. Peter, James, and John were there. Levi and his rowdy friends had cheated these very fishermen. There's a real chance that some of the money used to throw that party had been extorted from the very fishermen who are now there. The whole dynamic in that world was the tax collectors cheat the fishermen out of their money so that the tax collectors are rich, living the high life, and the fishermen are poor, living the hard life. And now the very tax collector that the fishermen hated and never would have gone and shared any with because they'd already stolen everything the fishermen had. Now those very fishermen are sitting at a table with the tax collectors worshiping Jesus together. Somebody says amen. Because the reality is we were the tax collector. The undeserving wicked sinner who had no right to the table. And what did Jesus do? He looked at us and saw us in our sin and called us out of it. And what is the church supposed to look like? The disciples of Jesus 
who say, oh, if Jesus has forgiven them, how could I withhold? If Jesus has invited them, how could I stay away? Friends, can we pause again for a moment? If Jesus was willing to call the failed fishermen and touch the outcast leper and restore the helpless paralytic and invite the wicked tax collector to follow him, from whom will Jesus withhold his grace? Nobody, not one who repents will be rejected by Jesus our Lord. Look, this truth is so critical. I want you to know this is not just me making it up. Don't just take my word for it. It is all throughout scripture. So I've got a few examples, all right? Here they are. Maybe one of the best known verses in all of God's word goes like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. When the rest of the world was condemning Levi, Jesus didn't do that. He saved him. He called him out. God so loved the world. That means if your two feet stand on this rocky ball called earth, God loves you. And if you repent, Jesus will save you. And you know what else it means? Those people you despise, if their two feet stand on this rocky ball called earth, Jesus loves them. And if they will repent, he will save them too. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Okay, another one. This is from 2 Peter. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God does not wish for anyone to perish. So you and I might have a short list or a long list of people that we would say, man, the world would be better off if we didn't waste our oxygen on them, right? The world would be better off if they were in the ground instead of above the ground. We may have a short list or a long list. I'll tell you this much, God has no list like that. It is not his will that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Repentance is a Bible word that simply means to turn from sin and find life in Jesus. Okay, one more. First Timothy 2. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Which people does God desire to be saved? All people. All people. Peter, James, and John saw Jesus save a man they despised. And by the end of the day, they were sitting at the same table celebrating the same Jesus side by side. Oh, City Light, it is my prayer that that testimony from Scripture would be written over and over again in our lives and in our church. Can we just pray for a moment together that God would do that? Lord Jesus, thank you that you go fishing where others do not go. At times, others would not go to catch fish nobody else has caught. That was us. And oh God, by your grace, would you make us a church that sees with your eyes and loves with your heart and multiplies disciples among all people for your glory and the good of counsel bless. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Luke chapter 5 begins with the story of Jesus calling Levi the tax collector. He's teaching us a new way of fishing for men. It ends with the Pharisees. These are religious folks. That simply means they don't want to look for, to Jesus to find their goodness or righteousness or holiness. They think they can find those things in themselves. They think they can achieve it on their own. That's what we mean when we talk about religion. It's finding righteousness in ourselves, not in Jesus. 
So these religious Pharisees, they confront Jesus on his new method of fishing for men by asking, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And I'll be honest, as I, as I was reading this passage and I was reflecting on, like, how do I connect here? Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? It reminds me of the challenge that I made to Harlan, the car detailer. Harlan, don't you know how to clean a car? It'd be a whole lot cleaner if you did it my way. The Pharisees are saying to Jesus and his disciples, don't you know how to be clean before God? It'd be a whole lot cleaner if you did it our way. Stayed away from those dirty sinners. And you know, they're not all wrong. Can we just be honest about that? We like to throw the Pharisees under the bus, but if we can be honest, they're not all wrong. The Bible itself gives instructions in the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs says, one who is righteous is a guide to his neighbor. You hang out with righteous people, he's going to guide you in good ways. But the way of the wicked leads them astray. If you follow wicked people, they're going to lead you away from God, not to him. We see it in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Who you spend your time with matters. And the Pharisees are tracking with that and they're saying, why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? There's truth to this idea that sin is contagious. Oftentimes sickness spreads and health is preserved. So the Pharisees are saying, if you hang out with sick people, you're going to catch what they got. Don't do that. Keep your distance. Jesus responds, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick do. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Jesus is saying, I'm doing something new. Remember what seat we sit in. I am the teacher, you are the student, right? Like, watch me, learn from me. Jesus is saying he is not the patient, he is the doctor. Patients and doctors walk into a hospital with different goals. I don't know about you, when I take my kids to the doctor, I become the most introverted person you will ever meet. Like, I don't know why other people are there. I don't know what other people are suffering from. I don't know how contagious it is, and I don't want to get it. And so when I'm sitting in a waiting room, I pick the seat furthest from any other breathing person, right? I don't talk to them. I don't make friends. I breathe shallow breaths, and I pray that the nurse calls my name as quickly as humanly possible, right? When I'm sitting there, I'm like, I'm vulnerable to this sickness and I don't want to get it. I keep my distance. That's a patient entering the hospital. And Jesus says, look, I'm doing something different. I am not a patient like you. I am not vulnerable to sin sickness like you are. And he just proven it. He touched a leper. And the leprosy did not infect Jesus. Jesus' cleanness covered the leper. I am not the patient. I am the doctor. I've come to heal. His remedy? Repentance. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's a Bible word that means turning away from sin and to Jesus. Repentance is rejecting sin, the old way of running away from God and instead embracing Jesus and running toward him. It's what Peter did in his boat. It's what Levi did when he left his tax booth behind and it's what Jesus wants for you and me too. Repentance. It's why he ate with tax collectors and sinners. It's the reason he stepped out of heaven to wear flesh and blood like us. It's the reason he still sends his Holy Spirit to live inside everyone who believes in him. Every sinner who repents will find forgiveness and healing and life and grace in Jesus, the great physician, the divine doctor who gets close to his people. Amen? We're doing good. <laughs> Friends, that's why Levi was throwing a party. Because he had experienced Jesus. 
Jesus had saved him and set him free, and it changed his life. And he said it's worthy to be celebrated. It's worthy to leave behind. Look, if Peter left behind a boat in his nets, he could go back and fish again. In fact, we see at the end of the book of John, John, uh, Peter and John are fishing again. If Levi leaves the tax booth behind, Rome is done with him. There is no going back. And so when Levi follows Jesus and says, you are worth leaving it all behind, to celebrate and invite the other tax collectors that I know to leave behind everything to meet you. Levi is saying, Jesus changed my life. There's more value in him than all the riches of the world. But the Pharisees, they just don't get it. They think Jesus' disciples should be fasting and mourning instead of celebrating. So Jesus compares it to a wedding. He says, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they'll fast in those days. Jesus is saying, you do not get solemn and refuse to eat at a wedding reception. Like, how obvious is that? When the bride and groom are there, and you are celebrating this new union, this new family, and all of the hope that there is in, that, in those vows You don't get solemn and refuse to celebrate. When the bridegroom is there, you party. In fact, even in Israelite tradition, the groomsmen are exempted from fasting during the wedding celebration. If it calls for a fast, you don't have to because you're partying with the groom. And so Jesus piggybacks on that and says, hey, if the groom, the bridegroom is here, It's not a time for solemn fasting. It is a time to party, to celebrate. To drive home his point, he tells two parables, two pictures of what's going on. First, a new patch on an old shirt doesn't work. If you try that, the new patch will shrink in the wash and tear apart the fabric of the old shirt. It just does not work. Second, he said, you don't put new wine in an old wineskin. This one is less familiar to us. Wineskins were bags made out of like a goat hide. And so in the beginning, if you pour new wine into that bag, there's some elasticity to it. And the new wine, as it ferments, would expand. And the elasticity of that goat hide would expand along with the fermenting wine and hold it in. But once that Hyde had expanded with the new wine's fermentation. If you tried to put more new wine into that old wine skin, it had lost its elasticity. So as the new wine fermented and expands, it would tear apart the old wine skin and you would lose the wine skin and the wine. Both parables are making the same point. Sometimes new things are not compatible with old things. And now Jesus, the great teacher, had just called a failed fisherman. He had touched the outcast, unclean leper. He had healed the helpless paralytic. He'd celebrated with the wicked tax collector. He is fishing for people in places no one else would go to catch people no one else had caught And he's saying his method of getting close to sinners to call them to repentance and offer them life and grace and healing and forgiveness is tearing up the Pharisees' old traditions of self-righteous separation. Jesus' new method of getting close to sinners is tearing up the idea that God wants us to stay far away from them. That's what Jesus is telling us, and the same Jesus that taught Peter and James and John that lesson as students in the front row of his earthly ministry left all of his people with the same mission. Just before he ascended into heaven, Jesus said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Jesus left his church instructions. We are currently the inheritors of this mission that Jesus left for his people. Fish for and catch people from everywhere, from all nations. There is no pond or pool I do not want you to go to. People from all nations, go make disciples. How do we do that? We baptize them and we teach them to obey what Jesus has commanded. What does that mean? Well, baptism is literally a picture of dying to sin and leaving your old life behind, right? Just like Peter left his boat and Levi left his booth, baptism is a picture that I'm going under the water and I am dying to sin. I'm leaving the life I had behind. And when I come up out of that water, I'm rising to new life in Christ, And what does new life in Christ look like? Obeying all that Jesus has commanded. It means that we follow him. We honor what he has said. We do what he has taught. We embrace a new way of life, fishing for men the way that Jesus did, honoring God the way that Jesus did. And as we live out Jesus' mission, he's promised to be with us. He's a God that does not keep his distance from sinners, but he gets close. He said, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. If there is no place he does not want us to go, there is no time he will not be with us as we follow him on this mission. And so friends, can I invite you today? Can I do my best to echo the call of scripture to our church today? Let's be a church body that looks for the failures, the outcast, the helpless, the hated, and anyone else we encounter and share the good news of Jesus' gospel with them. Let's go fishing for men and women. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? Awesome God. I'm so grateful that you sent Jesus because I am the failure I am the outcast, I am the helpless, I am the hated, I'm the sinner who was lost. This is not just a story about what I should do, it's a, it's a mirror held up showing me who I am. And when I could not, just like the Pharisees, they could not be righteous on their own. I could not do it. Jesus, your Bible has preached a better word for me. But I don't have to because you came for people like me. Jesus, I got to believe there are folks in this room today who could raise their hand and say, that's my story. I've been those people. I need a savior who would come to me because I can't make my way to him. Friend, if that's you today, would you take heart? There is nobody who turns to Jesus, who repents, who leaves a life of sin behind to say, Jesus, I need you as my Savior. There is nobody who Jesus will reject. There's nobody who will not get new life. So today, if that's you, will you just ask Jesus right now, will you save me? Will you you turn me from my sin and show me new life? My ears have heard the call that that Peter and Levi heard, follow me, and I say yes. If you say yes to Jesus today, welcome to the family. And friend, if you're sitting here and you've said yes to Jesus long ago, and it has been a long time since you've looked with his eyes at the people in the world around you, and felt in your heart the love that Jesus has for the lost, then let's get humble before Jesus today and say, if you're going to send me to places nobody else is going, at times when nobody else will go, 
to catch people that nobody else is willing to catch, then Jesus, where you lead, I will follow. Can we get humble today and say, Jesus, we want your glory all over our city, all over our region, all over this world. And so if we've left everything behind, then we can go wherever you send us. Jesus, would you send us this morning for your glory and our good? We want to lift you high and we want to get low. In Jesus' name.